What's up, my miners of intelligence and consciousness? I'm Rick Brooks, and this is Rick's Mind. Today with me, I have guest and friend Nick Ramos and the host of the History of the Cuban Revolutions podcast. Welcome to the show, brother. Hey, thank you for having me uh, back again. Very happy to Dude, see you guys. I, I'm, you know, I'm happy as always to see you, and and John is happy as well, aren't you, John? Oh, he's he's iffy. <laughs> so, dude, dude, thrilled. the world. No, John, is, John likes my stuff on Twitter all the time, and, for, and that I appreciate it. You know, <laughs> I am I am also terminally online, so I can't help it. <laughs> so, d- the world has has changed since we last talked, and I definitely did see you go on some Twitter rants. And, um, you know, I feel like this story is is pretty close to you. So, I I, I really wanted to get you on here as a historian, right, like to get your take on what's going on with the Russia-Ukraine war. Like, what what are your thoughts on that? Oh, oh man, where the hell do I begin? Um, so I've been following this thing for, for a long time, right? And, you know, um, in I, I've been following since like 2013, 2014, when stuff was getting tense originally. That's when the original invasion of Crimea happened, because I, I happened to be uh, seeing you know, a Russian-Ukrainian girl at the time and talking to her family about it. And uh, her family had sort of all sorts of political beliefs in it. You know, people that liked Putin, people that didn't like him. Uh, And so I got interested, and since then I've been following the situation and uh, getting closer to Ukraine. And I recently just published a piece about it, which, you know, some of the stuff uh, was a bit too hot to handle and got edited out. But as long as you have me here, I can say uh, whatever. I mean... <clears throat> Starting off at like the top level, yeah, it's it's an invasion. Russia decided to invade. It's a patently illegal, barbaric invasion, right? Like everybody knows that. But under the surface, um, it, it's it's an invasion that first started out as a civil war. Ukraine has had a, a culture war for about thirty years that has played out in two different uh, coups, more or less, of governments, which have seen both Russian and American involvement. And this finally bubbled uh, to an all-out shooting in 2014, when finally the big revolution, which is called Euro Maidan, happened. So I can start anywhere in there. In that, I can start all the way from from you know the 20 early 20th century, explaining what the hell Ukraine is, if you want me to. Dude, actually, let's go all the way back. Let's go all the way back. Is my 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 understanding, my take, right? Is <clears throat> Uh, and again, uh, to reiterate what you said, I am not taking a pro-Russian stance. I'm just taking, looking at it through the lens of history, right? And so, if I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about when you say early 20th century, and maybe you're going further. I, I start in the 80s with the reunification of Germany, and part of that agreement was that we would not expand NATO further eastward and since then we've let three countries in and then and then i go from <clears throat> the war in yugoslavia and our involvement with them and that and like kind of this this giant crescendo effect uh where the the russians are looking at the united states as a superpower saying uh fuck you you're not talking about us about the slavic people which is our sphere of influence and you've lied to us on three separate occasions we can't trust anything you say and and so that's kind of you know my 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 understanding of it, and 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 I'm I'm anxious to see if you're going to go further back, or you know, are, are we starting from the same place? Yeah, that's that's there's so there's two levels of the situation, right? There's like the domestic Ukrainian conflict, which does have international involvement, and then there's the great power games, which is what you're talking about. You're talking about like NATO, Russia, the United States, and and uh, with the NATO thing, like yeah, I'm on your side. Like Russia has has big reason to dislike the United States, right? Like after uh, the Soviet Union fell, essentially we were world hegemon. The world was prostate and we could remake it in any fashion we could. And what we told the Russians was what we're going to do is we're going to bring in people from, you know, our economic consensus in the IMF and we're going to do something called shock therapy, which is a quick transition to neoliberalism. All of your state assets are going to be sold off and are going to be instantly privatized. And this destroyed the Russian economy. Like life expectancy for Russian men went from something down like 62 to 58 in like three years. It like fell <laughs> like in an insane amount. Um, yeah. 
the Russians suffered a, a depression worse than uh, the Great Depression in the United States. It was an era rampant with like gangsters and corruption and murder and mobs. Hell, even even the father of someone I knew who was uh, he was a doctor in Russia. Um, he, he became like a like a card shark during that time period, working like at a, at a casino. Um, so it's just like a very bad bad time. Um, where Russia trusted the United States to help them out during this transition. And what we essentially did is we unleashed the worst tendencies and vultures of the world financial system in that country. Now, at that same time, uh, we help President Boris Yeltsin, who is, you know, a degenerate alcoholic whose brain was basically uh, pickled. Um, and in 1994, Yeltsin uh, is having uh, an election and he's about to lose. He's polling at like a 2%. And so he calls Bill Clinton on the phone and he's like, uh, and these, these have been declassified. And he's like, hey, I'm going to need a bunch of things from you. So first of all, I'm just going to need millions of dollars just for my campaign. Mm -hmm. And Clinton's like, well, I can't do that. We can't send you millions of dollars. So we, <laughs> where will we get that from? So he's like, OK, if you can't do that, I'm going to need something else from you. I'm going to need you to hold back on this NATO thing. Now, like you mentioned, there was a sort of like a behind the thing deal where yep. uh, I believe it was the president of NATO at that time um, and said that it wasn't going to expand further into Germany. And this was said mm -hmm. uh, to Gorbachev. Yep. Now we're at Yeltsin. And, and this is by the time that NATO already said it might expand. Uh, and Yeltsin already sent an open letter out the year before saying we don't want it to expand. But if it is going to expand, it has to include us or we have to be part of those deal of that yes. deal. And so he's already on record saying that. And so he's about to lose this 94 election and he calls Bill Clinton. One of the things he asks of Bill Clinton is please hold back on this NATO thing, because if I'm shown that I'm doing nothing on NATO, my people are going to throw me out. And so Bill Clinton actually relents. He, he, he stops talking about NATO expansion for a while and he secures he doesn't give Yeltsin like the millions of dollars, but he secures uh, speeds up an IMF loan. Uh, to Yeltsin for like $10 billion, mm. which Yeltsin uses to more or less win the election. <clears throat> so yep. so we have right away in 94, there's a recognition between the presidents. Earlier on, they don't want NATO expansion. In 94, Yeltsin is saying, I cannot win if I am not shown to be doing something about NATO expansion. Mm -hmm. In 2001, Putin apparently privately asks Bush if he could be part of NATO yep. in order to, to fight uh, terrorism now, terrorism. which was, was like the big thing of the 2000s for fighting terrorism. Mm -hmm. In 2007, the, the year, or 2008, 2007, the year where Putin is named Time Person of the Year, he says that NATO cannot expand further into Ukraine and Georgia. And then one year later in 2008, NATO says we're expanding into Ukraine and Georgia. So like that, that's, that's established. Like it's a long history of us treating Russia and their geo uh, and their goals with with content. Yep. However, right, like you can say, you can be someone that that says they no longer have a sphere of influence, right? Like this is all based on sphere of influence theory. It's that you know the big fish gets to act uh, strong around its smaller neighbors, just as we sort of impact what Mexico might do, right? Like we we set a here are the policy choices that would be amenable to us in Mexico and in South America, and Russia wants to do the same thing. Um, but to be a moral person, you can't make those allowments for your country and not make them for another country. So either you reject that theory in its entirety, you accept it, or you make the special claim that only we get to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, that I'm not sure about. I, I, I don't know which, which side I land on, but I do think that provoking them with NATO in the eye was a mistake. And now Ukraine I is in part paying for it. <clears throat> and I, I, I agree with you, but I, I do, and I want to get back to Russia, but I do want to dig into that because that is an interesting, that's an interesting talking point. Like, are we, cause I do think, right. Like primarily based off of, you know, a historical context, the United States spear of influence has always been the Americas, right? Like that yeah, is the Monroe doctrine. Yep, the Monroe Doctrine, anyone fucking comes to invade Cuba or does anything, we're at war immediately. And then I believe, and I could be wrong here, it is the next, like, Asian, like, South, South, South Pacific, Asia, yeah. it, the South Pacific is our other, like, that is our objective. Then the last is Europe. 
and for the if and I correct me if I'm mistaken, the Russian sphere of influence has always been you know Russia proper, some some in Asia, right? Mm-hmm. Um, particularly like in the back in the day, China and North Korea, all the yeah, they fought states. a war uh, against Japan. Mm-hmm, exactly the, the Russo-Japanese War, and they lost that, which was crazy. But um, and then the other part were the, were the Baltics and and mm-hmm. all the Slavs, right? That was a, a large reason that World War One started. Was like no matter what, we're bailing out the Slavs. That was our moral duty as a nation to help our people. Yeah, the Caucasus, <coughs> the Turkic areas. You know, yes. their, their aim has always been to expand into the Black Sea, and mm-hmm. at that point, against the Ottoman Empire. Yes, against yes, the and, Turks. And from a, you know, if we got to take it back even further, like just to look at the, the paranoia, Russia is a terribly complicated country to defend militarily because of the large grassland leading all into Moscow and to build a defense mechanism would be horribly expensive. So what they wanted to do is have a bunch of buffer states so they can tell where someone's invading and then they could send forces to stop that, right? Yeah. So that's really been their MO for hundreds of years. Both uh, Napoleon and, could, and Hitler march through yeah, Ukraine. Yeah. So, so th- there's, this is an area that has deep historical trauma and uh, you know a history of atrocities, and they don't want to see that now. Now, from their perspective, right? Like we're pointing a gun at their head. We've lied to them, and then not only that, they've asked numerous on numerous occasions. You pointed to a time in uh, with Bush. In the, Yeltsin say, asked, uh, and, 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 and Putin asked in 2001. Someone asked in the 70s, too. The Soviet Union asked in the 70s as well. Um, and I can't remember when. I, I know that that's true. John, maybe try and find that. Maybe not, though. Um, but but we, they've asked numerous times, So and we've said no. So that to them, that's like, um, so... We're just not in this club and everyone's ganging up on us like this doesn't uh, this doesn't sit right. So just from their perspective. Right. But but back to we're we're off. I'm off. I'm off on a tangent. But but back to like, do you do you think do you agree? Like, do you have a problem with us, the United States being like kind of the like this lone superpower? Right, like we have hegemony. Is that something? Where do you fall in that? Because that's that's a that's a a tough question, right? Being of Cuban <clears throat> origin, born in Cuba, right? You've seen the the nastiness of the the fucking sanctions, and they don't fucking work. But like, what 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 is your opinion on that? Man, that's that's a million dollar question, right? Um, it is. Yeah, I'm. I, I I have to be entirely honest. I'm bipolar on this subject. Because I because I think uh, it's sort of on a case by case basis, right? Like, so my my formative political years, at least, happened during the Iraq War, right? And I think at this point, it's I mean, if you believe anything we ever did in the Middle East at this point is good, you're insane, <laughs> right? Like nothing we did there under any guise of spreading democracy or whatnot, it didn't work. It we weren't actually spreading democracy. We weren't accounting for like whatever geopolitical conditions they had. More recently, we went to Libya and Libya is now what? It's a warlord state with open slave markets. It's like the, the, the capital changes hands with like which, every now, every now and then I play a game where I Google to see which warlord is in charge of Libya. And like it changes every year. Um, Syria was, was awful with the, the whole arming of the moderate rebels thing. When in reality, a bunch of like the stuff we sent ended up in the hands of like ISIS and other, um, similar militants. So completely bungled. Um, exporting in, in the 21st century, exporting American democracy. I don't know. I don't, I don't, it's, I mean, it, it didn't work in Vietnam. It, it traditionally, when we say we're exporting American democracy, realistically we're, we're doing, uh, especially with a lot of the weaker con- countries is plundering them. We're, yep. we're coming there with corporations and companies and setting up uh, institutions and presidents who are friendly to our financial interests. And this is sort of obscured in a way because of the successes that we had after the Second World War in certain areas. For example, we did pass the Marshall Plan that helped rebuild Europe. Now, at the same time, we sent a bunch of money to uh, parties so communist parties would lose, right? Particularly in Italy, we kept the communist party from taking control. Um, And if you're an anti-communist, which I am, I think, uh, everything is going to have to be, because I'm of two minds about this, everything is going to have a little caveat. Um, 
then that was a good thing, right? The Marshall Plan and keeping Western Europe uh, non-communist was a good thing. Um, and, and the successes of the occupation of Japan and South Korea, right? A lot of ugly stuff happened there. And for a while, we propped up actual dictators. Like South Korea was a dictatorship until like the 80s. Um, but, you know, Japan and South Korea now are developed countries with blossoming economy. Well, kind of. South Korea has a blossoming economy. Japan is stuck. And, you mm-hmm. know, cultural powerhouses and whatnot. <clears throat> so there have been some successes. But by and large, it's been failure. So I do think it's on a case-by-case basis that because there's no iron rule, but I think more often than not, it is best to simply stay out of other people's problems. More often than not, especially now when whenever we go to a country, there's like a 15 NGOs who all have different interests and are all trying to get their sons or daughters a position on some board. And there's... Um, I mean, we employed paramilitaries in in Iraq and, and in Afghanistan. We employed, like, the hell were they called? Uh, Blackwater? Blackwater. Yeah, we employed like, Blackwater. Blackwater USA. Like, mm-hmm. just disgusting stuff we get up to. Uh, and w- w- what also, what bothers me more uh, is that these things have become such a part of the American government and of the way the gears, that the, just how the United States operates, that they don't have democratic accountability. Right? Like, nope. The people don't really vote on on what shape uh, a military operation is going to take or what an occupation is going to look like. This is deep state stuff. This is stuff that just happens behind the background that's taken care of by like undersecretaries and interest groups and things like that. So it's an entirely unaccountable. It's the military industrial complex, right? And it's entirely 100%. unaccountable to any type of American democracy. It's just something that runs in the background like ambient noise. Uh, yes. And that's a very it's, ugly thing. It, it's so, a business. Yeah. I, I mean, it, just an example to end it there is that in, in Afghanistan, right? The Afghanistan papers came out. The New York Times released them. Not one person was fired. Not one person lost their job. We learned no lessons. There was more talk about whether or not Biden's withdrawal from Afghanistan was well done or not than of the 20 years <clears throat> of failed occupation. Mm-hmm. And so at some point, I think we have to ask the question, if these systems have no democratic accountability to us, perhaps they shouldn't be running at all. So I think that, that that's a really good synopsis. But I, I look at when you look at the withdrawal in Afghanistan, and I want to, yeah, I'm gonna, we're going here. I think that those people did from a, this is super dark, by the way, what I'm about to say. It's just a thought I've had for a while. I think they did a brilliant job of leaving all of that stuff behind. Do you want to know why? Why? Because we got to make more shit and we got to buy more shit. So they just secured massive amounts of government contracts and they could upgrade. They got to repair I think it. That I, mm-hmm, you don't have to repair any of that shit. You just make more shit. So all these companies that are manufacturing all that stuff get these contracts to make new and improved gear. I think that that, I don't think we did any of that. On, I, I think we definitely did that on purpose. We didn't want to salvage that. We wanted new shit. We wanted, we wanted to keep this thing going, right? Like, I think that that's really what the bottom line of this is. I think that, you know, this all this this war flaring up in in Russia, like when we're, you know, pu- pu- putting our chip, we're selling fucking guns. That's what we do. Like, we're yeah, really America's good at very fu- good at selling we're guns. We're very, yeah. dude, we make a fuck ton of guns. We're selling ammunition, missile systems. There are government contracts going out, and people are getting fucking rich. I just haven't figured out how to make money off of it yet uh, <laughs> through investment. Uh, another but plug yeah, for an engineering the, degree. Um, I, think, well, I think John wanted to say something. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, John. Oh, I, f- I just want to say, uh, Nick, go off about the fucking Afghan war. And Rick, you're close. It's obvious they left all that shit behind because now we got to go back and take it back and go to war with whatever the new terrorism thing will be in like 15 years. It's like how we're arming the Nazis in Ukraine. It'll be in 20 years. We'll be dealing with them. Okay, we have to be very careful because I can feel the energy in John and he's going to turn into a bummer cast. And we're, hey, we're pretty is, close. But <laughs> well, um, like it's, it's an unaccountable system. That's the problem of it, right? Like if if you can't. If the system just exists and it's ambient, and if we're going to make a claim for ourselves that we are a democracy and we choose our government and whatnot, then we should have some oversight of the system. And it shouldn't just run itself, but it does. And like you were mentioning, like, yeah, we've had a war economy forever. We just sell arms. Like, realistically, what are all these these 
why is our war economy always hot? Is because it's a job program. Like it's yep. it's a job program in the United States to hire people to make shit to sell shit. Like it, yeah. I, I, I don't know. It's, it's it sucks. It sucks if you're in a district. If you're a congressperson in a district that like needs whatever their factory to stay open for the military stuff. Eh, well, if if it pulls back, then you get fucked. So you keep yes. on voting for it forever and forever, and there's no accountability, and then it just leads to disastrous foreign policy. It, yeah, we we have really, we have really. Been, I guess I mean, bottom line is like I don't like all this finger pointing at um, you know, I again not pro Russian, but like our shit stinks real fucking bad. If I'll get into start, our, yeah, look, I'll get into our shit it, in Ukraine in just a little bit. Yeah. Y- yes, 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 and yeah, and we went off on a beautiful tangent, but we're now we're back on track. We're reset. We're refocused. We've talked our shit. And now we were previously at, I believe, Bush, Clinton, Russia not being allowed into NATO. And now I think we're going to, I think we're ready to do that deep dive into the Ukrainian side. What is Ukraine? What's going on? What, what's going on with, with some of the atrocities that they have create created in Donetsk and Lou something. I don't Lou, Luhansk. Lou, Lou, thank you. Luhansk. What's going on with the Russian separatist movement? Is this fucking real? Is it a lie? Let the, let the people here, let the, let the miners right, of yeah. intelligence here. So this, this here. is the part that I'm particularly knowledgeable about. So just by way of background, Ukraine, uh, we don't need to go back into like the Middle Ages, but Ukraine used to be a part of the uh, Russian Empire before it was Soviet. Uh, it's they have a they, they are ethnically similar, um, but they have a separate language. Although the language is mutually understandable, right? Like it's sort of like speaking between Romance languages. So mm-hmm. like between like French and Portuguese, or like Spanish and Portuguese, or something. Um, everybody in most people in Ukraine uh, understand both or speak one. They speak one or the other, understand both, or they speak both. Um, so uh, it was a part of the Russian Empire for many years. The Russians suppressed their language and treated Ukraine very badly, like a, like a backwater. Then comes the Bolsheviks. Uh, the Bolsheviks need allies. And so they, they sort of allow and encourage uh, a Ukrainian bloom, a bloom of Ukrainian nationalism, because the Bolsheviks are fighting their own civil war against the Russian whites. And so they tell the Ukrainians, OK, you can have your leaders, you can have your culture, but you got to help us. After the Civil War is over and Stalin takes over, um, that ends, of course. Stalin brings down the hammer and Ukraine gets once again folded up back into the Soviet Union. uh, And uh, it becomes very Soviet, particularly in those areas, which you mentioned, the Donbass region, Donetsk, Luhansk and Crimea, uh, because they were industrial areas. So since they were industrial areas, they had a lot more people traveling from Moscow and from the universities to work there. And specifically Crimea, uh, Sevastopol is the city yep. which has uh, it has a port. And since yep. it was around the Black Sea, it was also a resort town. So that area is also very, very uh, ru- uh, Russian. They, they are Russian speakers mainly. So, um, so uh, everything continues. The Soviet Union falls apart in 1991. And in 1991... Uh, Ukraine de- declares independence. But right away, right at like the highest moment of jubilation in independence, where every where they vote on it and almost every single state returns part, uh, they call them oblasts, which are provinces. Every single oblast in Ukraine um, votes like 80, 90 percent for independence. Crimea only votes 53 percent. So even at this like, wow, we're free moment. Crimea is like, hey, wait a second. Do we do we want to be part of Ukraine? And it's 53 percent. And they do do a conditional uh, independence, which means that Crimea is going to be an autonomous republic. It's going to have okay. its own constitution, its own president, and all that. And uh, in the 90s, Ukraine does away with that. They throw away uh, the, the independent president, but Crimea remains semi-autonomous and still has some rights that the other regions don't. So the 90s is, uh, in Ukraine, it's mostly concerned with like getting rid of communist influence, right? It's making sure the communists don't come back. By the 2000s, that's no longer the important, uh, I guess, political division, right? It's no longer like uh, reformers and liberals and conservatives and whatnot versus uh, Bolsheviks. That's over. Soviet Union is not coming back. And by this point, they've grown rich. Um, you, ha- you start to see the oligarchs, right? Like 
People who used to be leaders in communities or businessmen turn to oligarchs. And all of a sudden, these oligarchs begin disagreeing with each other. So now you have the start of political parties and strong political disagreement in Ukraine. And so in 2000, uh, there are two revolutions in Ukraine which are very important to understand now. Um, actually, before we get to the revolution, it's just another division. So uh, part of what I speak about, about this Ukrainian culture war, is between the East and the West, right? Eastern Ukraine is Russian-speaking majority. And these are Crimea, Donetsk, and Luhansk. Those are the areas that are now the rebel areas, the autonomous zones. They're the, the independent states, and Crimea is part of Russia. They're Russian-speaking, and traditionally they look to Russia. They look to Russia for leadership. They look to Russia for, you know, business, oil, whatever. They want to be part of, of the larger Russian world. Russia has its own version of the, of the European Union free trade thing, where it's mm -hmm. got like a bunch of its states that can trade amongst each other. And traditionally, Russia has subsidized Ukraine with a lot of oil. So they prefer their Russian past. And meanwhile, you have Western Ukraine, which faces the European Union, um, and they're more liberal. They're more of a fan of like democratizing, let's say, um, escaping this like post-Soviet uh, sleaze. You know, all these Soviet countries are very sleazy and are sort of, are we democratic? Are we not? Very corrupt. So a lot of these people, they look to the European Union as a chance to march forward into that, that future, which liberalism has promised. And mm -hmm. they're also primarily majority Ukrainian speaking. Yep. And so these two parts start having political disagreements and forming political parties that disagree about economics, the future of Ukraine, uh, candidates, um, language. Language is a very big thing. So w when Ukraine went uh, independent, there was a policy of something called U Ukrainianization, which was the closing down of schools that taught primarily in Russian and teaching everything in Ukrainian. Um, when there was a coup in 2014, one of the first things that happened was the repeal of a law that uh, said that the oblast, the provinces, could have a second official language if 10% of the people in that province spoke that language. And, and when the liberals or uh, reformers, whatever, the anti-Russians came to power in 2014, the first thing they did was repeal that law. Um, part of the culture war, for example, is this figure of uh, Bandera who was a, a World War II uh, Ukrainian nationalist who allied with the Nazis and also was an anti-Semite um, because he hated the Soviet Union so much that he wanted them gone. Now, at some point when he tried to declare independent Ukraine, the Nazis put him in jail. But still, right, like this is somebody who allied with the Nazis. The Russians mm -hmm. fought the Great Patriotic War. This is like their, their moment of like highest achievement of glory, of sacrifice. And to say that one of your national heroes now is going to be a Nazi sympathizer is sort of spitting in the graves of their ancestors. So when you see like uh, it's similar to how here, how uh, northern people don't like how uh, when statues of Robert E. Lee come up, mm -hmm. that type of thing. When statues of Bandera started coming out in Western Ukraine and people started seeing his picture in government offices and stuff like that. Well, Eastern Ukrainians didn't like that. So it's, yeah. it's a similar culture war situation over language <clears throat> and over future and over past, similar yeah. to what we got going on here, going on over there. If you so, want to interject so, before I get into 2004 and 2014, yeah, I'm feel gonna, free. I'm going to interject, right? I'm going to just break this down a little bit more. So when you have uh, Putin coming on and address those regions and saying, we're doing this to didn't, this is all part of propaganda, but maybe they've seen pictures of this guy that is a nazi and they're like what the fuck what is this country devolved and we're gonna we're gonna go in here on a special military operation and denazify this because they're they're paying homage to a guy that partnered with the nazis this i just want to break it down that that for the for the listeners right that geopolitics is incredibly complex and there are you're often dealing with so many layers and in, in hundreds of years sometimes well honestly in this case hundreds of years right of 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 ethnic and uh, eth not not necessarily ethnic cleansing, but lots of ethnicities and lots of languages going in and, and yeah, john <laughs> there was ethnic there was there was some of that but um there's a lot of there's a lot of parts and we're like 
we in the West are really only getting a very, very small digestible uh, pal- nugget of bullshit fed to us. When you really start reading these documents and looking into looking into really the specifics of what's been going on in this region for the past, let's even say the past like 30 years, it's astounding. There's a little, little, little nuggets of truth that you need to parse out yourself. And really, Nick, what you did in that article, which we will link, John, go ahead and link that too in the show notes. It's amazing. You broke it down. You broke down. You broke down the atrocities from the other side. We're only seeing them for, but like, there, the, obviously, it doesn't get to this point if there hasn't been like shit. Shit hasn't been flung on both sides. So I just wanted to, I wanted to put that out there, dude. And now you're, you're bring us home, brother. Bring us home. <laughs> yeah. So John, uh, John was saying that uh, Crimea is classically part of the Turkic Empire. Yeah. Russia seized Crimea from the Turks. And that's actually interesting. So what Rick just mentioned that we're only getting snippets. Here's another interesting snippet. In Crimea, there's a small, uh, the, not small, decent sized population of Tartars, which are like the traditional ethnic stem people from there. Yeah. Um, Stalin had a had a, a policy where he removed all the Tartars from Crimea or most of them. Uh, and it was sort of it was basically a genocide, more or less, um, because they were seen as Nazi collaborators. Then sometime in, in the 70s or the 80s, they were repopulated back to Crimea. And now uh, the Tartars were actually very pro-Ukrainian because of w- traditionally what, what has been done to them by the Russians uh, <laughs> has not been good. So yeah. when they saw that Crimea was about to go to Russia again, they were like, oh, crap. So uh, they're a population within Crimea, an ethnic minority, which is strongly pro-Ukrainian. So it's, it, there's, it's, it's never a neat thing in uh, like how you mentioned. So yeah, having yeah. laid out our battlegrounds in between East and West, um, we elect a man named Kuchma to the uh, 2000 uh, election. Uh, he wins. And, you know, he's your typical corrupt oligarch, that type of thing. Um, and, uh, so in, in well, the sort of the precipitating in 2004, there's going to be an, a presidential election and sort of the precipitating problem that starts happening is that one of his bodyguards runs away, uh, and takes a bunch of tapes with him. One of his bodyguards has been taping him for years. And these are like Nixon esque tapes that capture all sorts of political corruption, all sorts of nasty stuff. They have uh, him like talking bad about NATO. They have him lending Putin several millions of dollars for Putin's original 2000 election. And then after Putin from from Ukrainian state banks legally. And then when Putin wins, Putin returns that fivefold. So shady deals like that, intimidation of opponents to the media. But here's the big one. Um, There was a a dissident journalist uh, who was uh, kidnapped, uh, killed set on fire, his head was, he was decapitated and buried somewhere outside of Kyiv um, in the 2000, and this is prior to the 2004 election. And so he was a dissident journalist. Um, I think his name was Georgi Gungantse or something like that. Okay. Gungantse is definitely the last name. I know I'm butchering it. Um, No, no worries. So he, he was a dissident journalist. He had publicly questioned President Kuchma on TV. Uh, and he disappeared, was butchered, was set on fire. And uh, in those tapes was the president discussing getting rid of this guy. Like, what can we do with him? Maybe we should have uh, Chechens kidnap him. Maybe we should deport him to Georgia, where he's originally from. And so people hear this and instantly realize, oh, shit, <laughs> our president <laughs> probably killed this journalist. <laughs> yeah. So 2004 is the first of the big uh, revolutions, I guess, in Ukraine. Um, And and it pits uh, this guy called uh, Yushchenko uh, versus this guy called Yanukovych. I know the names are complicated, Yushchenko, Yanukovych, but more or less Yanukovych is the guy that was in power before he was overthrown recently in 2014. What started all of this was Yanukovych (laughs) getting overthrown. He's eventually gonna win election. So Yanukovych is the handpicked successor of this dirty president in the 2000s. And there's this guy running against him, a reformer called Yushchenko. And what happens is all the exit polls show this, that Yushchenko is going to win. But when uh, the uh, election results are announced, he lost. 
And it's clear there was corruption. It's clear the administration cheated to get their own guy in there. And so what happens is something known as a color revolution. This one is the orange revolution. And there have been a bunch of color revolutions, uh, you know, around that area. Georgia had a color revolution, for example. Um, and essentially we, what uh, political scientists call a color revolution is a relatively bloodless transfer of power where mass protests and uh, political leaders interject and manage to drive out whoever is in power, right? Yep. And so we love color revolutions because we see it as the people taking power and democratic accountability and all that. And the Russians hate color revolutions because they see it as part of a huge conspiracy to drive out anybody who supports them. Because yep. sure, behind every color revolution is a lot of homegrown support, but it's also a bunch of American money, uh, American pollsters, American advisors, um, NGOs. Like, um, for example, uh, the Assistant Secretary of State to Europe, Victoria Nuland, um, is it Nuland? I think so. Uh, bragged, I think, in early 2010 or late 2000s that we had spent something like $5 billion or $2 billion in Ukraine, right? And, and she, she said that openly. And when we hear that, we go like, oh, cool, right? Like yeah. she said, we spent that much to foster democracy in Ukraine. Now, when we hear that, we say, fine. But to the Russian mind, when they if we if we were to hear, oh, Russia spent five billion in Ukraine to bolster their interests. Well, the mind reels at what kind of disgusting things they could be planning. So one nation's. Uh, yeah, I, I, what was I about to say? Yeah, like one nation's fostering of something is another nation's subversion, more yeah, or less. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. It's meddling. It's meddling in their sphere of influence. They're like, yeah. I'm, so I'm I heard stories you. about the the Orange Revolution was a legitimate event. It was a bunch of people taking the street um, in two thousand four, demanding that the government do another election. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decides mm -hmm. yes, another election, and this time the right candidate wins. Yep. Um, Yanukovych, yeah. uh, not Yanukovych, uh, Yushchenko <laughs> wins. Yushchenko wins. Yeah. Cause and that's when, uh, you know, there's, you, I'm sure that we've all seen the images of the, the former president being evacuated to Russia on a helicopter. Not this yet. Is, no, that's 2014. No, oh, oh, that's so a, this that's lays the ground, oh, right? Okay. okay, okay this okay. lays the ground. This is the, this is an orange revolution. We saw an election happened. The people decided it was corrupt. The court decided it was corrupt. It was overturned. There was another guy in there. And it's part of a string of these color revolutions that have been popping up all around Russia's territory. So Russia, aside from NATO, is seeing something dark in this. They're seeing like the Soros Foundation and uh, Open Democracy and these types of foundations fund these things. Like I heard stories from the color revolution that were like, um, the reason why it's called orange is because it was their, um, their party color. I heard stories that like, it was raining, and so like a van drove by um, and started handing out like orange umbrellas so the news could pick up on the orange and be like, oh, it's an orange revolution. Look what they're doing, right? So like stuff like that, which is funny, uh, which obviously is like it's money pouring in from us to support a cause. Um, yeah. So that happens. Uh, the guy that wins the election has like an awful time in office. Like he can't get anything off the ground. He can't unite the forces that brought him, and he has to deal with like the worldwide recession because he came to office in 2004, and you know by 2007 the world is melting. Yep. So yeah. he does he can't even run again. And the guy that becomes president after him, Yanukovych, is the guy originally that he beat. So this guy that got thrown out of office is the guy that comes back. Now Yanukovych is is pro Russian, right? More pro Russian. Every single president balances the European Union and the United States and Russian, but Yanukovych is pro-Russian or more, more pro-Russian uh, and is supported in the East. He wins with like, if you look at an electoral map of Ukraine for this type of stuff, it looks like our elections, how the South votes for one candidate mm -hmm. and like the North and California votes for another. That's what it looks like. It looks like the entire East voting for like the pro-Russian candidate and the West voting for another one. So Yanukovych comes to power. Uh, now the inciting moment, the, the thing that sparks all of this is in 2014, and this is known as Euromaidan. Uh, Euromaidan, uh, is, is named after the park where they go protest 
they go protest in their central square and their central square is called Maidan. So in 2014, there's a trade deal put in front of Yanukovych from uh, the European Union. And it's going to be the ability to join the European Union common market, right? So we know the EU has a common market where people and goods, people can flow freely uh, without visas and goods can flow freely without tariffs, right? Mm -hmm. So the EU offers this and says, okay, and down the road, we're going to give you an IMF loan of like some millions of dollars. Now, Ukraine is already part of this like Russian EU. I'm forgetting the name. It's CI something, but whatever. It's it's their own free trade zone among the post-Soviet states, heavily subsidized with Russian oil. Uh, and so he has this deal in front of him. And uh, Putin counters and offers like a huge, like a huge, like bill, several billion, billion, billion dollar loan for him to say no. And Yanukovych... Uh, who has made overtures saying uh, before that, oh, no, Ukraine will have a European future, seems like he's about to do an, uh, an and like even advisors of the European Union were already there trying to manage the transition, right? This was seen as like the first step to join the European Union. So it looked like it was going to be a done deal. And Yanukovych randomly announces, no, I looked at the deals. Putin's deal is better. We're not going to be doing this. And, and it wasn't even known, uh, there wasn't even an attempt, like nobody knows whether the deals could have been made to work. Like nobody mm -hmm. tried to be like, okay, can we be part of this zone? Can we be part of that zone? Nobody tried. So when he announces this, people take to the square, a shit ton of people, like hundreds of thousands of people march on the square. And uh, from one of In the, the participants, winter. this is quoting uh, one of the a professor who was a participant. He himself admits that the deal was never to to protest what was going on. The deal was either Yanukovych changes his mind and signs his pro EU deal, or we're going to overthrow him. So it's it's a, like a very student led protest, mm -hmm. and you know the protests happen. But he takes a television and he explains the two deals. And the Russian deal, in my opinion, is certainly the better deal. Um, and he explains this. And eventually the protests start fizzling away. Until one day where the police descends on them at like four in the morning, like a few hundred students that are like sleeping and beat them. Yep. And so this is captured. It's put online. And all of a sudden, the protests suddenly have wind again and yep. more and more and more people take the streets and essentially from november to february yep. it's it's massive protests in the square that eventually turn into bloodshed right because there's already bloodshed going on basically if leaders like when whenever leaders left the protest like some of them vanish and are killed some of them are kidnapped so there's obviously shady stuff going from like the government side so in february what happens is they try to march on the parliament. And when they try to march on the parliament, someone, as always happens in these things, fires a shot, whether it was the police or whether it was the protesters. And then for two days, it turns into warfare, right? A hundred people are killed in the capital. Um, most, uh, what causes the most media attention are snipers. There are snipers in buildings that straight up shoot protesters. <sighs> um, Fuck. And so 103 people, like, think about it, um, over the entirety uh, of the entire BLM protests, like 12 to 20 people died. And those that were actually killed by police were like maybe five or four. And that's over like an entire summer of rioting. Whereas in two days here in, in the capital, 103 people die. So it's like a, an insane thing. Mm -hmm. And when this happens, uh, on top of the government passing already like a bunch of dictatorial laws where they can throw you in jail if you, uh, sorry, I was reading the chat, where they can throw no, you no. in jail if like you protest <laughs> wrong, um, the, the president does something presidents don't do, very weird, and he takes a sick leave. <laughs> he just says, you know what, I'm taking a sick leave, I'm heading out, and he goes to the fucking Olympics to like meet with Putin. He goes to the Sochi Olympics, he takes a sick leave, he comes back in time to like preside over like that, the killing of like a hundred people, and and he flees to Russia. 
<laughs> yeah, so this is what you were out. talking about. First, he flees to like his home region, which I think is Donetsk, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, he flee. It's either Donetsk or Luhansk. He flees to his home region, seeing if anybody supports him. And they're like, "Dude, after you killed a hundred people, we really can't be behind you." So <laughs> yeah. then he flees to Russia, and instantly the protesters take over, uh, depose the entire cabinet, depose the president, institute their own interim president, announce that elections would be coming up, and this is known as Zero Maidan Revolution. At Donetsk um, or Donbask. Donbass or Donetsk? Donetsk? Uh, Donbass is like the name of the Donbass. larger region. Okay. Yeah, Donbass is where... Uh, Donetsk and Luhansk are. Okay, cool, oh, okay. cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Um, All right. So that's that's Euromaidan. And that's that's the Western, pro-Western revolution that causes the war in 2014. Okay, so now we're finally at the conflict. We're finally at that conflict in 2014. There were a lot of things about that conflict that Russia didn't like. Let's start. Uh, the ambassador uh, that I mentioned uh, previously, Victoria Nuland, was out in the streets uh, handing like cookies and food to protesters to make sure they didn't leave. Uh, John McCain and other senators, before the shooting had ever started, flew to Ukraine and spoke publicly and said, what we're trying to do here is a peaceful transition of power. They admitted to wanting regime change before the shooting had started. And remember, Yanukovych is a democratically elected president. He won fair and square. Um, and and the weirdest of all were those snipers I mentioned. Mm-hmm. Because the snipers wasn't the government firing. It was right-wing militias among the protesters, right? Because times of conflict make weird bedfellows. And mm-hmm. so, of course, if you're going to be in an anti-Russian movement for a nationalist movement, you're going to end up with right-wing allies. So the snipers mm-hmm. were actually Ukrainian ultra-nationalist right-wingers firing on protesters to escalate the conflict. It was a false flag attack that got oh. entirely blamed on the Ukrainian government forces. And there was actually an independent paper like analyzing gigabytes and gigabytes of photos and videos and all of that, an academic one that's yet to be refuted. Saboteurs. So very are- weird shit. So Russia instantly yeah. sees this and they go, oh, okay. They just overthrew uh, a democratically elected government. We don't like this. At the same time, the provinces uh, that I was mentioning, the Donbass region and Crimea, also start not liking this. Again, the guy they just chose mm-hmm. just got overthrown. And, prim- uh, and uh, Crimea, uh, particularly, a lot of the troops that did fire on people in the capital, because it wasn't just sniper fire, it was also their special troops, their Berkut, Berkut, Berkut which mm-hmm. is like their military police. A bunch of them were Crimeans. And so in Crimea, just as the pro-EU protesters struck in the capital very quickly, um, in Crimea, pro-Russian people, with a lot of Russian nationals there, because a lot of Russians live in Crimea already, since uh, Sevastopol, like ports are, are uh, leased to the to the Russians throughout the years, um, strike and take over a city. So right away, Crimea thinks, "Oh shit, there's going to be reprisal from the capital." What do we do? As early as February sixth, which is uh, the president fled on the twenty second or twenty third. So even before the president fled, Crimea uh, sends is considering the Crimean Parliament. Uh, is considering asking Russia for help. Then, something called Little Green Men start appearing all over Crimea, which are <laughs> not aliens, but like dudes dressed in green. And, okay. and they're very polite, but they don't <clears throat> answer uh, where they're from or who they are. And now oh, we know yeah, they're yeah. Russian soldiers. Yeah. And so Russian soldiers, Little Green Men, start appearing all over Crimea. Within days after the president flees, uh, they, they take over the Crimean parliament they impose a pro-Russian parliament over Crimea and they have that parliament officially draft a letter to Putin asking for help. And so Putin goes to the Duma and says, okay, can I bring troops to Crimea? He asks for official permission. Of course, the the Duma says yes, which is stupid because he had already sent troops into Crimea. (laughs) So, you know, the man does as he please. And within days, Crimea, uh, falls to the Russians. There is no fighting, right? Because Crimea 
probably there is like a large possibility that if left to their own devices after the revolution, Crimea would have voted in favor of reunification with Russia. Yeah, but when yeah. Russia rolls their tank in tanks in right, and they they introduce a, a referendum which says, okay, do you want to be an autonomous republic republic of Ukraine or do you want to join Russia? And like the numbers come back like ninety eight percent join Russia. Obviously, a, a falsified poll like yeah, 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 the yeah, Ukrainian yeah. media wasn't allowed to to look. Like we have accounts of like ballot stuffing. Like yeah, it doesn't mean that Crimea wouldn't have wanted to join Russia. It just means that the referendum was illegitimate and false. Mm-hmm. And done yeah. at duress and a gunpoint. Yeah. So Crimea joins Russia right away. Then Donetsk and Luhansk, which are uh, the two areas that have the most pro-Russian sentiment, start taking, um, essentially start being inspired by Crimea's example. And they do the same thing. Pro-Russian protesters take over the government buildings. Militias start forming. These are paramilitaries. A bunch of like Russian adventurers like vets from the Afghanistan war and like uh, college students start coming in and like also joining these Ukrainian paramilitaries and they all have funny nicknames. Like this dude who used to work at Radio Shack uh, and used to like do telecommunications in Afghanistan has the nickname like Motorola. Um, (laughs) They use like social media a lot. Uh, They're led by this Russian guy called Strelkov, uh, who I think is also a vet. So the fuck do you know all this? I, I I've didn't read get to- a shit ton of this. Like I like I've read basically everything there is to read in in crime in about Crimea and like this region I've read. Yeah, go ahead, um, John. Yeah, I was gonna say the the guy you said what was it, the commander's name? Strelkov. Was it? Is that like Strelnikov, like from uh, uh, Doctor Zhivago? <laughs> There's a, that's the like the friend of Lara, I think, that joins the the Bolsheviks. I don't, I don't, I don't think so. No, it's that's Strelnikov, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, this guy's Strelkov, but Strelkov also isn't uh, his name. He is, I forget his uh, real name. Okay. One of those dudes. Uh, they also have like anime names too. Like I forget. Like one of those dudes is like Uchiha or Sasuke or something like that. Uh, like he, uh, some Russian guy has that has that nickname. Um, so, so these paramilitaries, which are very flashy, start forming, and uh, they they engage in open combat with the Ukrainian army. So like right away, they start trying to take territory and they do their own referendums. And in the referendums, they declare themselves independent. They, they declare themselves the People's Republic of Donetsk and the People's Republic of, du- uh, of Luhansk. Um, and so in, in response to this, the Ukrainian government passes a law and says they're all terrorists and authorizes its own militias to form. And so this is where we get that the infamous Azov Battalion. Right. The Nazis. Yeah, this is where we get the Nazis. So the Azov Battalion is one of these like flashy militias. Um, it right started wing. out as a neo-Nazi group. Its leader was elected to parliament sometime after Euromaidan in like 2014 or 2015. And even then, uh, when he's like trying to like clean up the group, he even admits publicly that it's anywhere from 10 to 20 percent neo-Nazi. Fuck. Um, <laughs> which if like if that's like the number you think you can get away with that's pretty <laughs> yeah, funny that's so it's, it's like good. it's clear that like it's a heavy neo-nazi influence group um and and if they're not explicitly neo-nazi then it's certainly fellow travelers you know it's yeah, people well, who might not be nazis but are certainly very right wing and he, again this is on both sides like it's not yeah. like it's not like the Russians don't have any Nazis. Like this yeah. is this is Eastern Europe. Like yeah. these are people but, uh, who have political opinions to the right of Attila the Hun. Yeah, a lot. Well, of it, it, I mean, honestly, though, I've, I'm going to take a pause here. A little bit of comedic relief. How the fuck do you think that conversation went? Like, listen, guys, listen. I've got a bunch of dudes that are ready to roll. Really, you do. You could. You can fight this threat. Yeah, yeah. But, 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 but. Anywhere between 15 to 20, maybe 10, maybe 10, they're Nazis. <laughs> they're, they're Nazis. Like, 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 like Z Kyle Nazi. Well, yeah, I mean, yes, yes. They're, they're, they're that skinheads. Maybe a little less. To, no, I, how the fuck? I just don't understand. Like, go ahead, John. 
<laughs> what's a few Nazis between friends? You yeah, know? yeah, you know. <laughs> what's a few, yeah? What's a few Nazis? Strange everyone has that fellows, weird. Right? Everyone has that weird racist uncles. Just think that a bunch of them just got together and formed a club. I don't know. So uh, you got like this weird alliance between like people who are like pro EU and are like yay civil rights and we're pro LGBT and stuff like that and like hardcore nationalists the enemy, with a healthy the enemy. side of Nazis. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Exactly. It's it's like it's nationalism, it's, right? It's, and, and especially it now, like those differences right now matter less. Like uh, when I was writing the article, one of the editors um, is is Russian anti Putin, and I spoke to a bunch of Ukrainian people during it too. And what they told me is, yes, Azov was Nazi. Nowadays, they have apparently a lot less Nazis. Okay. Uh, apparently, there have been there have been reports, right? Like there there have been people sent in. Uh, it's not that it's not heavily Nazi still, right? Like as obvious, like, down- grease, there was just a video they posted of them, like greasing their bullets with pig, uh, pig fat yeah, f- for the chest. Yeah, they definitely don't wear the black sun on every fucking. Yeah. They wear the they- black sun. Yeah. Um, but, um, a lot of people in Azov nowadays aren't necessarily Nazis. They're just strong Ukrainian nationalists. Yeah. Cause again, what like is- what you mentioned, enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? Yeah. Like right now, anyone who's fighting Russia and you like, this is a war for their survival of their goddamn country. Right. They're getting shelled. Like it doesn't matter. Even if listen, if I don't know, the Chinese started like uh, shelling um, Miami tomorrow. Right. I would have no qualms about getting in the back of a pickup truck with a Confederate flag. And like, those are my homies now until we get rid of the Chinese yoke. Right. So that's, to 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 make it clear, I think that's sort of the alliance that's going on. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. I'm not uh, here man. to judge. I mean, would you? Yeah. No, no, dude. I would. I there would be no questions. Like anyone that would would help me with the destruction of an invader, like they're my friend. Exactly. And yeah. and, and like so, I'm not. I'm making jokes, but um, uh, all I do have another. What the fuck is the black sun? I I didn't. I missed that. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, the black sun is the it's it's an it's a it was stolen from an ancient pagan uh symbol and it was it's based off of a design that i think goring had oh no in tile in one of his in his like one of his estates oh yeah the, the weird tile in the alps dude the yeah, nazis either, are so free either, man they're fucking crazy. It's either Goering or it was Himmler. Um, I'll look it up, but it's one of the two. Dude, the well, Nazis I mean, are so fruity. It's like, oh, dude. we found the ancient pagan butterfly buried underneath, oh, yeah. like yeah. Hildegard's wisps. Like the, yeah. they have like a bunch of these like pageantry, man. The, um, well, I, yeah, they were, but they were also like like reading the rise and fall of the Third Reich. Like I, 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 you know, I didn't realize how bad. Like you, you six million people. Fucking, t- but when you start getting into like what they actually did, that they actually created an economy out of like the Zyklon uh, B, whatever they gas them with, and then also like they were selling fucking the fertilizer from all of the um, uh, the cremated bodies, and so like, dude, yeah, it's, it's, don't forget the soap. It's super fucked. Read that at some point. Don't forget the soap. Too. Oh yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They, they made soap. soap they made fat. soap they out made of human out fat, of skin. dude. Leather out of skin. All true. I did not oh, read it, all the this black document. sun. It was in. It was in Himmler's, Himmler's castle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, talking about interesting. You mentioned the rise and fall, uh, and I was talking about how fruity the Nazis were. Um, William Scherer devotes like a like a like a portion of the book early on. You know, the book was it was written in its time to talk yeah. about how like how gay the Nazis were. <laughs> His words. He's he like did, the Nazis were did. homosexual degenerates. They were, they they were, were like, the- <laughs> you remember this part? You remember this part? Yes, 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 I do. I was like, what? These they were, they were homosexual like gay, gay clubbers. They were just high on meth. Yeah, yeah. the gay yeah. right winger. That's that's one yeah. of the <laughs> Yes, there yes. were a bunch of little Milo Yiannopoulos running log, around. They were log, log cabin Nazis. Log cabin. <laughs> full, of, full of moral depravity and homosexuality. The Nazis. Yeah, yeah I was just like, man. I was like, yeah, damn, I, dude, I, this dude really hates the Nazis oh or the gays. Oh, my God, dude. I, yeah, but I mean, his, that, have you read that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's why oh, I mentioned my, it. Oh, yeah, my goodness. Like, that that book just was. It's a hell of a book. I, yeah. it's, a, it's an incredible history, man. Congre- good. I would love to talk to him. Yeah. Really so, so uh, back to the the away from the free Nazis, back to Ukraine. <laughs> We're um, back on. 
So yeah, I mean, these 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 Nazis are fruity too, right? Actually, no. I think Slavic Nazis are scary, man. They're all like skinheads <laughs> and like Slavics Slavic are already like the scariest terrifying. type of white people. Fucking you add, you add like Nazism on that, like the scariest type of white people are Slavic people or Chechens. Duh. Um, one hundred percent. Oh, Dagestani's as dude, well. Anyone, all, any of those like UFC champions? <laughs> Kyrgyzstan. <laughs> Fu- I want nothing to fucking do with any of any if you're uh, Kyrgyzstan, Dagestan, Chechnya. This you're ho- they're, the, any but from the anyone from the Caucasus. Is yeah, anyone who like off, grows dude. up like lifting logs in a mountain and fighting you know, bears. Yeah. yeah, praying thirteen times a day. So what? <laughs> yeah, there's just something very potent about the combination of like Islam and Eastern European white people. Mm-hmm. Scares the shit it, out of me. It, 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 if you <laughs> have a beard, fighters nowadays. Yeah, if you can grow a beard when you're ten, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, yeah, the, the Azov is scared shitless of the Chechens because like those two, those two groups have beef. Yeah, um, what? What? Yeah, we. I do want to get into the like because I got when this this thing went down, and we're gonna sidebar this, but when this thing went down. And they're like the fucking Chechens are coming, and then I got all into the che- all into their propaganda, and they're just these massive human beings with massive beard. Their president praying. is a warlord. That's the, that's the hilarious part. Their president is was like the leader of the militia of the ex president, who after his dad died became a warlord, and he was an Instagram star. <laughs> wait, yes, wait, 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 no, is that Chechnya or is that um, that's Chechnya? Is it Chechnya? Because he has a UFC organization too, he, he or like might. A, a mix, a mix. Will you Google uh, fucking Eastern European UFC or not UFC mixed martial arts dictator? Let's see what that pops up. We're 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 way in the weeds here. Sorry. Are you folks. thinking of Ramsam Kadyrov? Ra- yes, yes, yes. Who? Where? Where is he from? That's a Chechen. The, oh, no shit, dude! I didn't know that was Chechnya. Yeah. Wow. Fascinating. Yeah, so, they, so those two, those two groups have beef, as you can probably guess. The neo Nazis don't yeah. like the Muslims a lot, and vice versa. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. But yeah, okay, we we we're back off, back on. Where, yeah. where were we? Yeah. So the militias start forming, right? They got they got funny names. They form on both sides, and so on one side is the Ukrainian army, now getting uh, a shit ton of money from the West and rearming itself, and their their funny paramilitary. Well, not funny. They're paramilitaries. Um, and on the other side is originally the paramilitaries with a bunch of Russian adventurers and then the Russian army itself. Because, of course, the Ukrainian army beats back the, the, the militias all the way to the border. And then Russia supports them and invades and beats back mm-hmm. the Ukrainian army, I think, with like paratroopers, but putting paratroopers behind them. Uh, and they kick them back to, to their zone. Now, I want to make something clear. Not all of the Donbass region left along with Donetsk and Luhansk. Those are just like, you know, big areas, but like a bunch of uh, the Donbass region, like uh, Mariupol and like other cities, Mariupol, um, within like a week of the original referendums, which are like, we're independent republics, they passed their own referendum and returned to Ukraine. And now these cities are like the ones that have been punished most heavily by the Russian uh, bombing campaigns. Mm, um, and, and so from, from 2014 to today, you, what you have is like this back and forth war that at some point sort of becomes like World War One, with like trenches yep. and the trenches represent like uh, division <clears throat> borders and they move a little mm-hmm. bit here and they move a little bit there, but they're stable. And like the Ukrainian side is constantly shelling the rebel cities. Uh, they've tried to reach several agreements, Minsk one and Minsk two, Minsk one fell apart instantly. Minsk too has a bunch of points, um, which says that eventually, like, it says that the U- Ukraine has to move toward a more uh, decentralized, federalized uh, structure of government, mm-hmm. uh, and that Donetsk and Luhansk will have like their own independent like privileges and stuff like that. Uh, but nobody exactly knows what those will be, right? Like they haven't ironed anything out. And Ukraine insists, okay, before we do anything, we have to have our borders back. And these regions insist, okay, no, you're not getting the borders back until we agree to something definite. And even then, there have been internal emails leaked from them that, that say that um, they intend to resist any, any rule from the capital. So, like, it's, it's like, 
it hasn't made them friends, you know, no. like b getting your city shelled for from 2014 to 2022 hasn't made you any friendlier to the other side, you know, battling another sides. And so the, these places started sort of becoming like states, right? Like their their militias now are more like armies. <coughs> yeah. um, they've received uh, armaments from Russia. So and, yeah. it was a civil war that Russia had to step into to keep one side from losing. But yep. it was a civil war. And it was a civil war that's been ongoing until now, until Putin made, you know, all his best claims, historical, economic, NATO, blah, 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 and decided, OK, I'm invading. I'm recognizing these two as independent Russian uh, republics. And more likely than not, they are Russian puppets, more or less. Yeah. They, they need to be to survive. Yes, they they have to be hundred percent, and and it's just I find it interesting his speech, and I'm going to butcher this, but he he brought up an old Soviet law. Do you know what I'm talking about, Nick? Like, I, it, it, I'm, had, I'm, it had. I'm not remembering, but I know he started his story. He said that the Bolsheviks in, invented Ukraine. Yes, but he also said, like, um, basically he left the door open for that the USS never really legally, the USSR never really legally dissolved. And that, like, a lot, I do not, John, do you, you know what I'm talking about? Or am I talking out of my yeah. ass? No, I, I pulled it up. It was, um, thank you. It was like two or three days into the Ukrainian invasion. Um, this was, so this is a quote from Putin, from this speech from Putin. Um, I'll start with the fact that modern Ukraine was entirely created by Russia, more precisely Bolshevik communist Russia. This process began almost immediately after the revolution of 1917 and Lenin and his associates did it in a very rude way towards Russia itself by separating, tearing away from it, part of its own historical territories. Of course, no one asked about anything, uh, to the millions of people who lived there. Then on the eve and after the Great Patriotic War, Stalin already annexed to the USSR and transferred to Ukraine some lands that previously belonged to Poland, Romania, and Hungary. At the same time, as a kind of, kind of compensation, Stalin endowed Poland with part of the original German territories, and in 1954, Khrushchev, for some reason, took away Crimea from Russia and gave it to the uh, to Ukraine. Actually, this is how the territory of Soviet Ukraine was formed. Yeah. Uh, Khrushchev gives uh, the Crimean oblast to uh, Ukraine for administrative reasons, but realistically, it remained very much in control of uh, the Soviet metropole. How does this end? How do we get out of here? How do we, how do we stop this bloodshed? I mean, in my opinion, I think you got to just give pretty much eastern ukraine to the russians yeah i mean and that's lost like crimea is not returning um nope. and, and by the way the soviet the russians have a bunch of other shadier reasons for taking crimea uh they have to do with oil there was a bunch of yep. oil discovered um they need this region to like crimea is also uh doesn't have any water yeah so they need this yes. region to secure crimean water a bunch yes. of stuff like that well, didn't uh, didn't Ukraine dam um, some sort of river going? Yeah, the Ukraine Ukraine Russia. stopped the yeah. dam that gives water yeah. to Crimea. So the mm -hmm. Russians have to bring water to Crimea in other ways. Like yeah. the, these places are have not been happy being the the Russians have not profited from this in the slightest. No, no, is what I'm trying no. to say. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, John. So here's my crackpot theory, and I'll bounce it off you, Nick. I think so. My family's from the Baltic region, so I'm a little, you know paranoid about it but i think you know some people have said that putin's trying just to put back together the ussr which i think is maybe a little bit i kind of think that he's trying to connect his oblasts to have land routes to all of all of the russian oblasts that are not connected like um kaliningrad on the baltic and crimea because they only have there's a bridge that goes from Russia across to Crimea, but it could be taken out by a missile. That's their only route there. Yeah. Now they have Donbass. They have a land route. I think that I I personally think the next thing that's going to go down <clears throat> sometime will be either Poland or just Lithuania and Latvia. I'm going to um, press press pause because right in, there. in John Kaliningrad. You, well, there's a, a huge submarine base. You there. need to explain Kaliningrad to people that don't understand what that oh, is. Okay. Please do. Kaliningrad. Kaliningrad is an oblast 
of Russia. It's completely it's it's a political island. Uh, it was a former territory of the Prussian Empire, the Teutonic Knights, and the Lithuanian uh, Kingdom, the Kingdom of Lithuania. It's right directly west of Lithuania. It's essentially a small city, but has been a uh, part of Russia since the Russian Empire uh, with Tsar, the Tsar's Russian Empire. And there has been, I believe, since the, at least the 70s, a massive... Uh, submarine base and a huge military it's basically just a military base the size of a city um and how how they let russia keep that i have no idea will you link a map or an image or some yeah. or like a link to so people can look at that thank you yeah definitely yeah when, when you it i listen um strangely missing from pretty much all of putin's war justifications or economic reasons right and it's it would be foolish to think that these people who very high up in the Duma, who are, you know, multi-billionaires in the Rome right with like very shady money, the oligarchs, it would be very stupid to think that they have no economic considerations for such a massive undertaking. Like sort of where I view this is that, yeah, all their geopolitical stuff is true. All of it matters a lot to them. Sure. Uh, Putin's prestige matters a lot to them. Sure. This, this would make him more popular, uh, possibly, if it succeeds. And it's, it looks like it's going to succeed to some extent. Um, and yeah, it sets them up better for the future, right? Like if they swallow up uh, eastern Ukraine, uh, w- what it looks like it's going to be is like they're going to swallow up eastern Ukraine. Crimea is going to stay with them. Ukraine is going to be a significantly weaker state, uh, having no access to the oil they would have had access to in Crimea. So they're not going to be able to undercut uh, Ukrainian oil. To their north is Belarus. Belarus is already uh, they are a Russian, a Russian like, like if, state. Yeah. Yeah, like like if Putin tells Lukashenko to like sit down and drink from a water bowl, he's gonna do it. Um and so all of a sudden, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, right, are gonna be entirely close to Russian territory. And those people have access to the Baltic Sea. So those those are another another important area that Russia might look to expand in its future. Um, yeah, John. Um, so I I kind of think it's it's partly like like I had said land routes, but then also too Russia doesn't have you know land routes to get troops to the Baltic. They don't have access if they have if they have land routes to Kaliningrad, they could full scale invade any part of Europe or even North America easily um and then too with the there's another thing that is interesting that the i forget the name of the treaty that uh, was at the montreux accord or something that controlled how the bosphorus strait was used um there turkey is turkey the united states and one other country have been fighting to keep the montreux convention uh which is entirely outdated in power because it, there's a stipulation in it that as long as uh, some, I forget who, I'll look it up, someone has uh, a warship in the Bosphorus Strait that it is under control by them or something like that. And uh, there's they're talking about doing something to prevent, the United States, I think, is trying to push Turkey to prevent Russia from having direct access um, out through the Bosporus Strait uh, to basically dig an 80, however, 80 kilometer something long, basically a canal next to the Bosporus Strait. And the Turkish government has been buying up land along the, the Bosporus Strait for years trying to eventually do this. Interesting. Interesting. I didn't know about the Bosporus stuff, actually. Yeah. But yeah, like what John was saying is right. You know, there's like a little island of Kaliningrad, which is like in northern Poland, like north of Poland in between Poland and Lithuania and the Baltic Sea. Yeah. Yep. So, so yeah, I mean, it, it, it moves up their border by a lot. Belarus is a client yes. state. Uh, Ukraine is going to be like weakened and devastated by this. Yep. And all of a sudden, a bunch of their ex-states are in a better uh, place. So if they ever decide to have like color revolutions or anything like that, instantly See, it's a no, no, no from Russia. That's um, exactly kind of what we're, I mean, I'm, I think, I mean, Georgia, cause there was a massive civil unrest in Georgia. And as far as I'm concerned, that's pretty much. Yeah, there was, there was a similar hands. thing in Georgia, right? Like a mm-hmm. part of Georgia seceded and then uh, Georgia invaded to get it back and Russia invaded Georgia to keep it separate. 
Um, yeah. <clears throat> but like, there's also like the broader question, which is the right of secession, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, for example, most recently, I think Catalonia was trying to secede from Spain and Spain said, no, can't do that. No, so, yeah, but there's been, that's the, that's the Basque nation, the Basque speaking people, correct? In the north of Spain. Am I wrong? No, well, the ba yes, the Basque are in North Spain, and they have tried to secede. But Catalonia is where uh, Barcelona oh, and fuck, yeah. uh, yes. Valencia are. Yes, yes, yes. Because yes. like, I mean, they have a completely region. Oh, and I they have and they have a wildly different culture than Spain. It's it's way more um, mixed with like the classical uh, more when uh, it was a when they it speak was ruled a different by, language. Uh, the Moors. Yeah. They speak a different language. language it's is, like a whole different dialect of uh, Spanish. Yeah, language is important. Language it's, is extremely it's one, important it's, because it's, it's one an of the instant identifier. Uh, if you don't like each other, it's an instant way to tell an us versus a them. Like, yes, so it's, it is. it's like the clearest linguistic marker. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's auditory marker to be able to tell someone that's not you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, uh, re returning to that. So like that's that's a very interesting question. I think which is. So t t let's say let's say this way: Donetsk and Luhansk had about fifteen percent of Ukraine's population. So the mm -hmm. current war is thirty-seven million versus seven million. Mm -hmm. um, fifteen percent of the U.S. population is California, plus some smaller states. If California and some small Western states um, say they have a right to secede, uh, do we go to war for that? 100%. Do you think they should be able to secede? Well, no. Uh, are you asking me this, dog? I mean, not asking you to answer uh, the question. It's just it's on a case by case basis. But certainly it goes to the question of uh, do smaller territories today have a right to secession? I, you know, and I'm not going to answer this. I, I would say our country would go to war over that 100 percent. We'd right? kill Gavin uh, Newsom. <laughs> King Gavin. <laughs> Flay him in the town square. I fucking love you, dude. I <laughs> dude, I would vote for like whoever promises that like actually Gavin's awesome, but like I would vote for whoever promises to like You're kill Gavin in like the National Mall in 2024. Um, there's a, whatever there's party. A, there's a guy running um Fuck, I'm gonna a get a phone call from this. <laughs> God damn it. Uh no. Hold on. I have There's no ill dude. intentions toward Mr. Newsom and the, yeah. the Michael Schallen Michael Schellenberger is running for uh, governor in California, and I'm not a Californian. His but name is Schellenberger. I, Schellenberger, yes. Not like Shalom think, Burger. No, no, no. Schellenberger. S H E L L E N B E R G E R. Sh Michael. Schellenberg, you should look up his policies because they're they're especially um, his plans regarding uh, dealing with the homeless seem like they're a what's, pretty. Uh, he's what's running, he running as, as? An, an independent. No fucking chance, dude. Independent, <laughs> independent. Come on, man. No dude, chance. I, I think I think he's got a chance, man. I think all he's got to do is come in second. I'm excited. Um, I don't know why I'm excited about this. Does Newsom to get to run me. another term? I don't know. Um, I, yeah, I, I think so. I think he's going to, Dude, it's but, King Newsom. He's not going away, man. Dude, I don't say that. that's such a dark thing to say. I, I just don't get that. But, um, back on, back on top and, and we, I want to be respectful of your time. So we got to wrap it up. But I mean, in your yeah. opinion, this, this ends with, with the country split in two. This end, uh, Zelensky's already put out several statements to the effect that, uh, Ukraine, what they're going to look to in the future is going to be Israel. Like they're going to be uh, literally today. He said we're going to try to be a state like Israel. So which which means that it's going to be a militarized state, right? So expect Damn. there to be a national draft. Expect to see like armed men in movie theaters and stuff like that. Um, Israel has traditionally had enemies on their borders, right? Mm -hmm. So Ukraine looks to emulate that. Um, I don't think they're going to get Eastern Ukraine back. I don't think Crimea is coming back. Um, and yeah, it's going to live having to play the uncomfortable role of buffer state. So I do not feel happy for what the yeah. Ukrainians are going to have to put up with in the future. No. Yeah. It's and not Russia, be good. This has been, I don't know, kind of, I don't know if it's stupid of them or not, but they have not profited very much from this. They've had to subsidize Crimea for a number, like a great amount of years. They've had to subsidize like these two breakaway republics. They've been censored, like eh, not censored. Um, what the hell is it? Um, the economic sanctioned. They've, yeah, been, they've sanctioned been sanctioned to hell and back. 
like essentially, I think at some point Putin came to the realization or what he believes is that the United States is going to keep supporting orange revolutions until it ends up in Moscow, until there's one that takes him down. So mm-hmm. he decided that, hey, if the West isn't going to deal with me, if like if their 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 reaction right off the bat is going to be that I am not a legitimate government and the doom is not legitimate and the Kremlin is is a phony government, then if they're never going to deal with me, I'm just going to keep on digging a deeper hole to see if I come out on the other end of the earth. Yep. See if I dig deep enough to somehow get out of this. I mean, he him sinking the ruble up with uh, only accepting payments for natural gas and oil with the ruble was pretty fucking clever because even though we've sanctioned them, yeah, we're the still buying that, right? right? It's bounce. It's bouncing back. Yeah. So it's like that sanction didn't work. Like the only way that they like he kind of he has he has all of Western Europe by the balls because of all the fuel, right? Yeah. Uh, and we're buying fuel from him as well. So like I just want everyone to know that. Yeah. Um, so him doing that was a good move, and then also getting aid. And this is something I haven't looked into, but the, I believe he requested economic aid from China. And that's, see, this is something we, you know, we've had uh, Laszlo Montgomery on the pod, podcast, host of the, the China History podcast, right? Um, this is. Oh, uh, I think I, yeah, yeah, I think I've listened to it. Yeah, this is an area that we need to address because this, that's, I mean, Russia is, they're um, um, to, um, I've got to say, they're a military superpower. They have hypersonic. Um, assets right so um any of our early detection nuclear uh, early detection nuclear uh procedures are nullified because this these these missiles tra- travel 27 times faster than the speed mock 27 27 27 times faster than the speed of sound right nuclear deterrent thank you john um so they, they've got a speed on that and so does china but china really they could hurt us. Like, look at, look what happened with COVID, right? Like we, our medical supply chain went down. We couldn't get fucking drugs. We've just sold our souls and manufacturing prowess down the river to them and them, the way that they're handling this and watching this, like, all right, so they, they annexed that. And we know that Taiwan is a rogue state and I, I was mistaken by this. I thought that we had almost like a defense pact with Taiwan. That is not the case at all. I, I forever, I, dude, for, until like six months ago, I, I thought that if they invaded Taiwan, we're going to war. And I was like, that's the end of it. That yeah. is not the case. Oh, I, can't, now, I can't see the United States dying for Taiwan. No, no. But what about – I? I I, I believe I believe that the that Japan included Taiwan into their defense perimeter. I believe that that John, will you pull that up? I could be talking. I think Japan is rearming now. Oh no, they're fucking full on rearming, dude. <laughs> they're full on rearming. So are the Germans, which Don't I'm, I'm about the Germans. Germans. So, <laughs> I've never seen this movie before. Yeah, everybody's getting strapped. It's it's so weird watching everybody getting strapped again. Uh, this is like the entire point. Of what, like the 1945 post world order was supposed to stop. I know, dude. But like, Americans don't worried. want to underwrite anyone's security anymore. Like we're we're yeah, not we as don't. rich as we used to be. We are not, dude. We are not. And um, you know, I think the the complete, just, utter shambles that our political system is in is just part of the problem. We yeah. never we never addressed. That we never addressed Eisenhower when he said, "Be be careful of the military industrial complex." Like, s- listen, guys, I'm in office. I, I was one of the most powerful men in the world two times over. Right, I was a supreme Allied commander of the entire European theater. Right, and now I'm the president. I'm uh, essentially at this point in time, he's a fucking emperor. Honestly. Honestly, he's a fucking yeah. emperor. He has he has he has all of Europe and all of Asia in the palm of his hand, and he's like, "There's a military industrial complex, and we need to do something about this." That's See, my reaction you to guys. that is fucking G thinks, old man. Like, 
Oh, very cool, dude. Something you helped build up all throughout the 50s and while you're you're doddering asses out of the way. It's like, oh, by the way, guys, here's something I leave you with. You motherfucker. (laughs) John, go ahead. Um, So I don't know if exactly Japan said they would like they expanded their their sphere of, of influence defense yeah, perimeter defense perimeter but what they they said in their 20 uh 2021 defense of japan white paper it's nuclear um, right are they they're yeah, going nuclear they said yeah that um they consider taiwan stability uh paramount to uh japan's uh, yes. security I, I re- so am, am i am i like dreaming or, or did japan say they want to go nuclear again well, not again. I don't know if they want to say go nuclear, but I know they are rearming. They could be nu- they could be nuclear in like five. They, minutes, you too. know, if there's one country that deserves to be nuclear, I think it's Japan. Here it is. Uh, here it is. So Japan, Japan isn't getting their own nuclear weapons. They're calling for the United States to consider hosting nuclear. Oh, power only Jesus nuclear Christ, weapons Japan, dude! Which really? Like, that's oh, not man. good. That's oh, not good. Oh, I hope dude, that nuclear we, weapons right there next to manchuria uh, i really hope that what do you mean what do you you mean manchu quo well, that's manchu quo yeah whatever yeah, the hell that's it's a, called that now. that is a total no no manchu quo was what the japanese yeah. named manchuria. <laughs> that was a total history joke dude yeah uh, i know i know <laughs> we're i'm nerding out too I much remember, right i remember now. i remember the invasion yeah <laughs> i was there but um <laughs> This is fucking crazy, man. Um, but no, man, it's it's interesting to see that the the world the world has has changed into a much more hostile place. I I think that um, the idea of you know like oh we can all be together and we you know we we're 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 beyond that and, you know we're beyond war. Maybe we never felt that way, but like I I I'm saddened by this, and and the reason one large reason is. A lot of the institutional memory we have of a great war is almost all gone. All of the World War II veterans are almost all gone. And so they can't really warn us about how fucking terrible this is. Like, this is the first peer to peer conflict. And when I say that, two powers with pretty much the same amount of force mul- multipliers facing each other in open battle that we've seen in 80 years. And it's not fucking going great. And it's not, and, and, and my opinion, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't even think it's gotten to as ruthless as a point as some of these battles in World War II. It's no, been absolutely, not, no. fuck, absolutely fucking terrible. Yeah, because it's lots been a siege. Of lives. Yeah, because yeah, it's yeah, essentially, like Ukraine is essentially being sieged. <clears throat> yes, not exactly. Like two people pushing on each other. No, exactly. So it's not, but I'm saying like if if they decided to intensify operations, I don't think like, there's a hospital that got hit, taken out, and and people are like, "That's terrible! It's an atrocity!" If war, the entire act of war is a fucking yeah, atrocity. dude. Like with sanctioning of murder and the firebombing of Dresden, like how many innocents do you think died in total war? The the, the yeah. Nazi invasion of Russia and the Russian invasion of everything else. Right. So many mm-hmm. civilians got caught in the middle of that. Yes. All yes. civilians got caught in the middle of that, mm-hmm. basically. Yeah. And we just nasty, nasty stuff. Yeah, it's nasty. And that's why we have to stop this. Like at any cost, like we don't like we don't understand you and I don't we've never experienced it, but we've read about it and we understand just how fucking nasty this shit can get. John, go ahead. Oh, two things. So first thing I've mentioned this on the show before the book War is a Racket by Smedley Butler. Yeah, Smedley Butler, Uh, baby. He's, you know. He's the guy that the uh, Bushes tried to have install a fascist dictatorship. Gangster for capitalism. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then um, second thing, I was listening to, I believe it was NPR today, and they were talking about how there's so many people in like, in the political sphere are trying to, like, trying to figure out what they want to call war crimes uh, in Ukraine because they said they've been finding, like, executed people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if it's military, only military or what, but um, sorry, my dog's uh, jingling. Uh, <laughs> but they were just like, what What are war crimes? And I'm like, that sounds just like war, like <laughs> not necessarily even a war crime, to be honest. Yeah. Like, I mean, how many fucking civilians did, like you said, when we just like leveled Germany and Japan before we nuked Japan, how many well, freaking thousands we, of people? Did yeah, we and with like do- the bombing of like Pakistani weddings or whatever, Afghanistan yeah. weddings or yeah. what, like whatever, what about- you know. 
We've committed a Isn't few war something... crimes in the Middle East. Definitely the yeah, shit it... in fucking Fallujah, I think. Yeah. What about Yemen? Didn't aren't we Syria? Wait, was it Yemen that we yeah, are Saudi Arabia is committing war crimes in Yemen? And Yemen, that's it. That's we. It, that's I'm pretty it. sure we committed war crimes by using depleted uranium in in Fallujah, and like kids are still being born with fucked up diseases from Iraq. Um, we also gave uh, the Saudi Arabians or sold all the weapons to the Saudi Arabians that they're using to drone the Yemeni people. Yeah, you know, it's very hard to control war crimes during war. Yeah, it is. International it law is. isn't worth shit. Like the last it few isn't. people to get dragged in front of like the International Court of Justice or whatever, are those like Serbian war criminals. You know, it's yeah. very easy to get like dragged into a court if you're a small state. But if you're like Saudi Arabia and we're protecting you or if you're like Russia... Who the hell is gonna, yeah. you know, walk into yeah. Moscow and take you to an international court? It's 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 all it's all a joke. Yeah, it's it's all a joke. Well, listen, man, speak to the people. Tell them where they can find you. Get let's get the, let's get this plug in. Thank man. you. Okay. Just follow me on Twitter, Nick Ramos underscore one. That's it. I also have a podcast. It's about Cuba. Uh, it's called History of the Cuban Revolution. You can find it anywhere you want. Fantastic, man. As always, dude. Thank you for having me. It's always lovely. Point. It's always a pleasure, brother. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much, man. Um, if you love us and you don't want to see John die, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, if you listen to this podcast on iTunes, give it, give us a five star rating. Um, and John, John's going to be okay. I appreciate it, good folks, and uh, we'll see you next week. Oh, 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 o